Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with vocalist, songwriter, arranger, and performer Melody Dacian. This Juno and National Jazz Award nominee is releasing a new 2022 album, Sumner's Tales, The Music of Sting. She has been praised for her soulful confidence, exquisite intonation, phrasing, and sense of time. On this new project, she remains faithful to the essence of the songs, whether they are huge hits like Roxanne or B-sides like Murder by Numbers. The soloists roam free over grooves and soundscapes that run the gamut from lush to bombastic. She's got a great story. Enjoy this interview. Hi. Joe Domino, Neon Jazz Radio in Kansas City. How are you? I'm well, Joe. How are you doing? I'm great. Thanks for taking a minute out today. Oh, it's a pleasure. So, before we get into your brand new album, the music of Sting, yep. which you know to me, yeah, Sting is just, um, yeah, he, he's wonderful. I mean, that's not even I don't even know what the right word for Sting is, but he, he <laughs> definitely he, it's hard to put the right word on him. But what I want to ask you is we've gone through quite a time on planet earth over the last couple of years with the pandemic and artists have really been kind of run through the ringers. So I'm curious, how did you survive the pandemic and how did it change you subsequently? Wow. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, you know, some people through the pandemic, some musicians through the pandemic were really creative and took the opportunity to hunker down and write and record and, get a ton done. Uh, I was not one of those people. I <laughs> kind of rested. I don't know. I, I didn't feel like I had the mental capacity to, to do what my colleagues did. <laughs> um, but how I came out on the other end, uh, after you know that rest, when I got back into it and had the opportunity to play with other people again, um, I have to say that I came back with renewed vigor and passion, <laughs> you know, because because of the music industry being what it is, like it can be a path to burnout. You know what I mean? Where you just do a lot and you work a lot, and and, and sometimes you wonder what the returns are going to be. And if you don't have that passion on your own. Um, it's a, you can't really expect to get it from other people. You know what I mean? Whether they're listeners or fellow musicians. So you really need that fire burning for yourself. And I, it, it did bring it back for me in a weird way. You, you hit the nail on the head. When this whole thing was unfolding, I was thinking, there might be major recording artists that have done nothing but run their whole career, like in that Justin Bieber style or whatever it may be, that may just say, mm -hmm. I'm, I got money, I have you know, Grammys, I have a claim, I've proven my point, I just want to relax and watch a bird land on a tree, you know, kind of that Buddhist <laughs> mentality, you know, and, but, mm -hmm. so I get it, and I, and I think that there's so many people that I've interviewed and asked the question to, where it's like, yeah, it really wasn't all bad, and, you know, it, there, there was a moment to pause me, the Venice Canal cleared up, the air in Beijing got clear, there was a lot of things yeah. from, Mother Nature down to the human soul that needed to be cleansed. And we, as a yes. country, you know, Americans were yeah. already a car teetering on the edge. So you throw George Floyd, you throw in class riots, you throw in all yes. these things because, you know, America can't just have a pandemic. We have to have somebody <laughs> throw a whole, whole thing of gasoline into the fire and then throw yeah. fireworks around it and have, you know, so anyway. I think yeah. at the end, long story short, we all needed that moment to say, what What does all of this mean? Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> so, what so, a time, right? Uh, yeah, what a time. right. Well, and then, so what a time to have somebody as uh, magnanimous as Sting to cover. So what was it like, and, you know, and I'm not a musician, I'm just an admirer, but I would have to imagine when you really start feeling back the layers of a mind like Sting that came up with the police, and all of this music, that had to be a playground. Oh, my gosh. That's an understatement. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, first of all, like, I remember listening to the police when I was, like, in my early teens. Our, you know, Synchronicity was one of the first albums that I bought with my own money. 
that I played, you know, I had an LP and I'd, you know, put the arm to the back position so that this, a side would just repeat over and over again, you know. Um, when I listened to that, to songs from that album in particular, to this day, I know every lyric. And the idea for the album actually came out, came to me in 2018 when we were mixing the, my EP called Get Back to the Groove from 2018. So we weren't even done with, with that project when I got this idea to, to do um, a jazz album of Sting covers. And so the plan, we were all set to record in 2020, in June, yeah, June of 2020. We had done a couple concerts. We had all the charts written, all the arrangements sorted out. And then, well, you know what happened. Um, so we put it off for another two years um, till just May of this year to record. In that time, we had two years to refine our song choices and tweak the arrangements to make them really exactly what we wanted. Um, right up to the last minute, actually, the day before we went into the studio, we were still refining arrangements. And uh, talk about how do you choose what songs you're going to record. You know, you can only fit, what is it, 80 minutes on a compact disc? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We had to cut. We had to cut two songs because we had too much uh, music for one recording. Um, but even to get to th those twelve songs that we ended up with, you know, we we had twenty that it was really hurting me to try and even limit it to twenty songs I wanted to do. Do you know what I mean for, the, for like live concerts? Because there's so much material. There are so many great songs, and yeah, it was. It was a challenge, but a fun one. <laughs> so so this next question is going to be kind of in that fangirl moment here. Is Sting going to hear this, and, and, and how does all that work? Uh, uh, that would be really cool. Um, I actually did a little internet Nancy Drew session and, and found an email address for his management company. And... <laughs> I wanted to um, I wanted to put a, a quote of his on in the liner notes, and you know you don't really need permission to quote somebody, but I kind of wanted to contact them. Just you know, it's kind of kind of an excuse for me to contact them. And it's this beautiful quote that ends with, "Music is its own reward," and I just think that's so beautiful. Um, so anyway, long story short, I they did get back to me and, and they said no. <laughs> But uh, I do intend to send the album um, in hopes that he might hear it. And actually, um, one of the musicians on the album, uh, Michael Occupenti, fabulous guitar player, unique gu guitar player, um, he, when we were talking about putting together the album, he, he made a good point. He said, you know, when I come up with arrangements of songs that were written by other people, I, I think to myself, would that artist like my version of their song? And so that's how we kind of approached recording these songs. We didn't want to just throw something out that was a straight-up cover. You know, we wanted to bring something fresh that Sting himself would like. <laughs> yeah. It's a little fangirl moment. <laughs> yeah. I remember years ago, um, a Kansas City musician was telling me they were playing outside of a very risky hotel called the Raphael on kind of mm -hmm. one of our bougie areas known as the Plaza, the shopping district. And yeah. Paul McCartney was in town playing at the Sprint Center. So these guys knew that and heard through the grapevine that Paul was staying there. And they start playing a Beatles song. And they said that this bodyguard was this massive, enormous guy came out and said, can you guys please stop doing this? He can't. He can't hear the songs anymore, and he was kind of telling <gasps> you the story. No. And it, it, it wasn't a bad thing, but um, but it was just the way it was. And I've heard that Paul yeah. had issues sometimes with people covering things, but I think if it comes out in the right way, they have to hear it because there has to be some kind of level of clearance for copyright and all that, correct? It just oh, yeah, for sure. To, yeah, yeah. So, so probably just with that in mind, you know, I mean, how cool would it be if, you know, Sting's driving around on tour and he comes across the jazz station and it's like, 
there you go, you know, and uh, yeah, life is serious I know. like that, you know. And, you know, but, if and if he doesn't care for it, I don't need to know. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't need to know, but it would be good if, if otherwise it would happen. So are you, you're in Toronto now, correct? Actually, no, I'm in Western Canada. Okay. I live in a little town called Nelson, British Columbia, which is the westernmost province in Canada. Um, we're just north of Spokane, if that makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. I've been up there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A beautiful yeah. part of the world. So I, I came here because um, I, I'm, I was invited to join the music faculty at, at, a, at a college called Selkirk College here in Nelson. And now I'm the school chair for the School of the Arts. And so, yeah, that, that job kept me busy through all of the pandemic business, too, because I was instructing music on Zoom, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. So well, that's good. I remained busy with that. Well, that's the thing I think that's been very hopeful and good about this time is that, you know, as much as people kind of, there's been a level of, of you know, jazz education that people know it exists. But I think it was solidified over this pandemic period. I think it gave people, it kept musicians in the game because it gave them income. And I think, too, mm -hmm. from what I've learned from a lot of musicians, that you would think a lot of younger musicians may be scared away because of opportunities going away and just fear, you know, of, of not mm -hmm. having a career. But they said that the influx and the amount of kids is more than ever. So that's all very hopeful, I think, for the world of jazz and the jazz community at large. Well, yeah, and I think people, everyone had a chance during our rest, you know, to look inward and realize how important things other than money are, uh, you know, how important our well-being and our our growth, you know, how important those kinds of things are. So, yeah, it's really curious. Um, I'm, I, I, I see... I don't see young musicians um, shrinking away from it at all. It's the opposite. They're maybe they're even getting more support from the people around them too. Such a healthy, deep thing. <laughs> Absolutely, and I think yeah. that's been what we've all learned over this time is to go for things that are, you know, n not as temporal. Something that's deeper. Um, yeah. So Did you keep up with your radio show over the pandemic? Oh yeah! In fact, I ramped it up more yeah. than ever. I did more interviews over that over that time. I I've, I've been doing my show since 2011, and in 2020, I did almost double the interviews that I did of any really solid year that I had. I just I had to make a decision when that started because I was in yeah. shock. Like, what am I going to yeah. do? And I just decided because I have a uh, I have a son with special needs, and then I have a stepdaughter who's like the opposite. You know, she's like. Or yeah. she was 14 going on 30. So I would right. play interviews on speaker for them. So that's how mm. I fill my time. So they would hear all these interviews, and overwhelmingly most of the musicians, there was just the positivity or there was a resilience in their tone. So it was mm. really good, and they got to see that was something that I loved that I didn't want to stop doing, but I wanted to weave them into it. You really couldn't do anything over the pandemic too. So we drive around at like nature parks and stuff like that and listening to interviews. And um, mm. so, yeah, anyway, I ramped up and it was, it, it was really, it was triumphant and it was heartbreaking, you know, especially talking to musicians that were, you know, in these little boxes of apartments in New York and, you know, yeah. really they, couldn't do much and you know i mean anyway i mean where you're at i'm sure it's probably more expansive you could get in a car and go somewhere and you have nature all around you um but oh, yeah. some of these yeah. people that were in these urban concrete jungles so mm. to speak couldn't do anything so yeah. yeah um there was a fascinating tapestry of, of story going on during that time but it is so good to see things coming out and to see artists so another part of you having this album out has to feel relieving and almost like a Phoenix rebirth to be able to have music. You can do live shows. There's almost a shock yeah. that the world's getting back to what we knew before. Yeah, there is. And, I, you know, I'm booking um, shows for next summer, hoping to do um, jazz festival tours. And uh, I think I'm getting the vibe that people are catching up from shows that got postponed you know, for the last two, two, three years, you know, so 
Uh, yeah, I, I get a sense that there's a catch-up happening right now. Yeah, but, for uh, sure. I also learned so, patience, so that's good. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and and I noticed that in my kids was that there's a level in all of all of the kids in the world, like there's a level of resiliency and pause that went into this. I mean, if things don't work out, it's not as magnanimous as it was prior to 2020. Everything was turned upside down. You know, it wasn't like one or two things were affected. Everything was affected. So, um, but I'm curious with you, how did this journey begin? How did the seeds of jazz and music begin in you and, and get to where they're at today? Yeah, my father um, was a piano player and a singer um, in his soul. And he, he did... He was a professional, but um, his vocation, his career was an English teacher. So he would, you know, teach in the week and then do gigs on the weekend. And um, so I was singing with him when I was, I don't know, beyond, like before I can remember kind of thing. And our idea of hanging out and having a good time was just singing songs together. Um, I remember writing my first little melody when I was, like five or six, and I took piano lessons for a little bit. Um, and one big influence also was my godfather it was Don Hahn. He, um, he's a the late great Don Hahn was a, a very well known recording engineer who worked for A and M Records and A and R Records both. And he would send us play copies from recordings he'd done. So he recorded like Sinatra. He recorded. Uh, James Brown, he recorded, you know, so many fantastic artists. But so I heard, you know, I got these play copies of all these wonderful artists, um, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis, Big Band being one of them. And at the time, I didn't separate things into genres, you know, like, remember I had Tchaikovsky record and pop record, Karen Carpenter, you know. Um, so I didn't know what the different genres were. I just knew what I liked. I actually remember listening to this Thad Jones, Mel Lewis album. It was a live uh, album. I don't remember the name of it, but when at the end of a solo, when the crowd applauded, I thought they were welcoming the next person on stage. <laughs> I didn't realize they were applauding the solo that just happened. You know, it didn't it didn't roll out that way in my mind. But so yeah, so listen to all this great music, and then when I was like. Seven, I started singing in front of crowds, uh, did the band program through junior high school and high school. Uh, I started playing French horn in grade seven, and then in grade eight, I started playing electric bass, and I joined the jazz band. So that's when I really started understanding like the difference between jazz and other kinds of music, and started singing that repertoire more. And I just, I knew I wanted to pursue music. Uh, you know, I would, had a moment in grade 11 where I was a little chicken about it, but it was brief. Um, ended up going to study jazz performance at McGill University in Montreal, Quebec. And that's kind of cold notes of how it happened. But yeah, my dad and my godfather were, were both really early influences on me. What was the first live show that you ever saw that blew you away? That I saw? Yeah. Oh. I, I'd, I'd have to think about that for a while. Um, All right, we'll come back. To, we can come back to that. Okay. Can yeah, I tell you yeah, one we, more recent one that blew me away? Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, that's totally fine. Okay, so I wasn't expecting to be blown away, but in 2018... I saw um, David Sanborn in Calgary, Alberta, and he had James Genus, and he had um, Jeff Kane Watts and Jeffrey Keezer and Michael Dees, and <laughs> I just could not believe the music that was coming off the stage. It was incredible. Um, I had seen Jeff Kane Watts before. Um, but hadn't seen any of the other musicians live, and uh, I just like I was completely astounded. 
<laughs> and you know, to be honest, the uh, David Sanborn previously, I remember his remember the show he did was it Night Music. He was like hosting that. I think it was the eighties. I really enjoyed that show, but on recordings, I always find that his sound is so. It's like it's like diamond etching glass. You know, it's so um, almost shrill to me that yeah. it kind of takes over what I'm hearing in recordings. But when I heard him live, it was a completely different thing, and just all that music. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's got quite a lineup too. Um, what is? Yeah, what is it that you like the best about being a professional musician? You know, you get to wake up every day, you get to create music, but there's a process that goes into it. What do you look forward to the most? Yeah, there are a couple things that come to mind. One thing, it's a personal moment, but when I write a piece of music, a, a new song, and I finish it, that is a one-of-a-kind experience. I'm not a mother, but <laughs> I'm a mother of the songs that I've written. And to me, like that, I don't know. There's nothing like that to me. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is the moment, I think um, people refer to it as the uh, flow experience, um, a peak experience where you're in the music and you lose sense of self uh, you lose sense of time, and it's just everything feels like it happens by itself. You know, it's just things click. And I think I remember the first time that happened to me. I was in a concert when I was 15. My father was playing piano. I had a friend playing bass, another friend playing drums, and I just experienced that for the first time. And I honestly think every time a musician has experienced that when they go to perform at any other time after that, they're always trying to get back to that. And it doesn't happen very often, um, at least for me. But when it does happen, it's just, um, it's almost like a spiritual experience. If you could get into a time machine and go back in time and see a performer live, who would it be? Who would you love to see? Um, I saw Miles Davis uh, in his you know, final few years. Uh, but I would have loved to have seen him with some of the earlier groups, you know. Um, I kind of feel like I was born too late. <laughs> yeah. Cases, for a lot of the music. I get it. You know, the music from the 50s and 60s, like, ugh, so good. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's who, yeah. Does that count? Yeah, it does, because actually my, my son's name is Miles for obvious reasons, so I get it. Mm. <laughs> I totally get it. So if you have a dream tonight and you run into your younger version, say, you know, right when you were starting your career off, and you could mm -hmm. give your younger version one piece of advice based on what you've learned, and it's not about regret, it's about dispensing wisdom, what would you tell your mm -hmm. younger version? Yes, and you know, I think about this when I work with younger musicians all the time. I would say... Dream bigger. My dream when I was really little was just, I just wanted to be a musician. I just want to make a life in music. And then, you know, I've done that. Uh, and I think that insecurity that is inside a lot of us holds us back. Um, and I, yeah, I think I'd say that, yeah. Just don't be afraid to dream bigger. For sure. So everyone has a perception or an idea of who they think you are, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you're the one that's living your life. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? I think I'm a music fan, and I think I'm a musician fan. I'm a good hang. <laughs> uh, I, think cool. I'm, I think I'm fun, and I think I have a pretty healthy sense of my abilities and my my weaknesses as well but uh, yeah ultimately i just love being in the moment making music with people i like and love i like that answer melody thank you for opening up good luck with the album um i uh i'm having a hard time picking the the right track but i'll get to that point you'll hear it when the show comes out 
Ah, uh, thank you so much. R- really nice to talk to you today. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and singers and minds in Vancouver, New York City, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Melody for her time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Tomorrow's another day. Neon Jazz.